And hey, good evening. <laughs> Teresa Croft with you. Kingdom Messenger Network. We're live on radio and video. And thank you, William, for letting us know good sound. This is Anna Croft and her guest, Sadie. Yes, we are Hi. on live Hi. now. So, ladies, what are you going to sing for us, Anna? Finally found where I belong. <laughs> All right. Praise God. Let's make sure we know everyone knows that you are on. Go ahead. Welcome if you're just joining us.
you sell mouse in? Thank you very much. If I sell mouse, how about uh, Howie and Rogues? Yeah. I can gently follow you. This is like in the craft croft cottage. Croft. So Anna, go ahead. Let's uh, go on in. Show them where the coffee is. As we uh, make our way into 
the kitchen. There's the coffee. I am moving on the coffee. Oh, that's not why we're here. Okay. And the beautiful outside. And we just gently put the camera down where Firebrand Dave is residing. Let's kind of get things situated here, Firebrand Dave. Oh, sorry. I guess I'm kind of weak here. Oops, sorry. All right, I'm going to give the mic over to Dave. Make sure we got the volume up. If you're watching us on radio, you're missing all this. You're listening, I should say. As uh, we say, good evening and welcome to Firebrand Table Talk. That's pretty nice of uh, Sadie and Anna. Very beautiful. Thank you so much. All right, Firebrand Dave. Praise the Lord. Amen. Father, we just thank you for allowing us to gather into your presence, and we thank you that the Holy Spirit is our guide. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, your word says. And so we just thank you for directing our steps tonight, Father. May every word that's presented be straight from your throne room. May it be life, Father, deliverance, healing, and salvation to those that don't know you yet, Father. We just thank you, Father, for being in control. Hallelujah. And thank you that the foundation that we're building upon is that of the chief cornerstone of Christ the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach in Hebrew. Mm. And we thank you, Father, that you're so faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness when we confess our sins before you, as your word says, Father. And we thank you, Father, that you put a sign on that bank that says you can't fish there anymore because you've cast those sins in the sea of forgetfulness. You do something that we're unable to do most of the time. We're unable to forget. We say we forgive, but we can't forget. But we need to learn that through the power of the mind of Christ, all things are possible with God if we believe. And God does something from His nature as He cleanses, He eradicates, He erases the charges or the sins, if you will, that were imputed against us. So God forgets where man doesn't. So grateful that while I was yet being formed in the lowest parts of the earth, you knew my being. Hallelujah. Right. While I was being yet formed in my mother's womb, you were ordaining my steps. So we just thank you, Father, that you're in control of life. Father, we do pray that the bane of sexual immorality will continually be exposed and torn down, Father. But, Father, what we're asking for is the desire to be stirred, the hunger and the thirst to be stirred inside the hearts of your children, the hearts of your people. Because if there's no appetite for wickedness, evil, abomination, sin, hallelujah, then the world changes. Mm. And when our appetite grows so large for Christ, hallelujah, <laughs> that it's our number one goal, then many will be saved and born again, healed, delivered, and set free. Now you said in Matthew chapter 10, for us to go forth, lay hands on the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper. You said heal the sick. Behold, we freely receive, so we should freely give. Teach us, Father, how to let the incessant power of Your Holy Spirit flow through us to meet whatever need that's presented before us each and every time, whatever that need might be, because that's the most important gift is the one that's needed for that moment. So thank You for allowing us to minister one to another. Thank You for the beautiful worship songs tonight with Anna and Sadie. Thank You for the precious hearts of those that are seeking You wholeheartedly. We bless you and praise you and thank you for doing all things well. In the name of Yeshua, Hamashiach, Amen. Christ, Amen. the Messiah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. I was reading and studying some notes and <clears throat> sometimes you know you, you leave off you version where you left off you version, you go back and it's in a totally different place and, and uh, I know nobody had been near my iPad, so I, I know that God was speaking something very strong to me. And and as I studied this week in uh, John chapter 4, if you will, uh, God began to speak to me about the Father in Christ being one, or Christ and the Father being one, ever how you want to present it. And He began to talk to me and said something very powerful in His Word over in Psalm 138, verse 2. And... Uh, 
is only God can bring revelation. You can read something a thousand times, but it just seems like when God just wants to bring something alive, you know, He just speaks it to you. And then you go there and you go, wow, I never saw that before. It's just the most yeah. amazing thing when God gives you that kind of revelation. Hallelujah. He says, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. You have magnified your word above all your name. Verse 1 says, I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. Mm -hmm. Now notice that what's being recorded and stated is that the psalmist wanted to worship God with all that was within him. There's just something about entering into that presence of the Holy Spirit when you begin to worship Him. And you begin to pour out everything that's inside of you for Him. And the most magnificent thing begins to take place. Hallelujah. And uh, the first thing that I notice when I get in His presence is, is I just want Him to cleanse me. I just want to be holy, holy, holy before the holy, holy, holy of holies. Yeah. And what God says is, is if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to cleanse us and to forgive us. But He's, he's faithful and just to forgive us but and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as you move in the power of the being of Christ living inside of you, the Word just comes like as the Holy Spirit says He's going to bring all things to your remembrance. And what was so amazing is I began to understand that at different times in our life we have to rely on God's faithfulness. And the way to rely on God's faithfulness is to have that journal always handy and have that notepad always handy. So when the enemy tries to attack you and convince you that God's not this or God's not that and He's not doing this and He's not doing that, then you've got a record of what He's done before when you've asked Him to do something. And you go back and you begin to stir up that gift that's on yes. the inside of you. And you know, sometimes you're going to be the only one that's going to stir that gift up inside of you. Yeah. But it's an honor for God to allow us to stir the gifts in others. Yes. It's a precious gift of the Holy Ghost. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to Him. Right. Hallelujah. And as he began to, David began to experience some things in his life, as he began to experience the resentment, and he began to experience the envy mm -hmm. from Saul, the first chosen king over Israel, yep. he had to step outside the boundaries and he had to learn what the real gold standard of God is. Right. The real gold standard of God is not to hold offense. Mm -hmm. See, when you start talking about not holding offense, you're talking about something. You see, uh, Saul sought David with everything that he had. David had to leave and go out and live as a madman in the wilderness. He had to move from cave to cave. Hallelujah. To elude Saul that was trying to kill him. And God had delivered him into his David's hand. And David's heart smote him because when he was fast asleep, God called a, caused him to go to sleep and uh, his watchmen fell out too. Their eyes were so heavy they couldn't stay awake. And David went in and cut off a little piece of Saul's robe. And then he began, and when he got a, a distance between them again, he began to holler and tell him that the watchman wasn't doing his job, that he wasn't looking after his master. But David's heart smote him that he'd even cut the robe off of Saul because he realized that Saul was God's first chosen vessel of honor as a king over the nation of Israel. And if you look deep inside this, you begin to see some real gold in the integrity of a man that was named a man after God's own heart. Hallelujah. And what you begin to understand from David is that, see, David recognized that Saul's sin, even though he was trying to kill him, was against God. And it was between God and Saul. Wow. Hallelujah. Even though he was trying to kill David, David wouldn't avenge his adversary. Right. It was his own kinfolk. It was his own brethren. It was his yes. own from his own nation. That's a powerful statement when you can realize how much somebody means to God and not take offense even though they're trying to kill you. Mm. Now, David could have smote him. David could have drove a spear or cut off his head in the cave, but David chose to believe that that battle belonged to the Lord. 
that that sin that Saul had committed was between God and Saul, not God, David, and Saul. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we forget when we're the other end of the offense or we're being persecuted, we forget that it's not us they're persecuting, you know. It's Christ in us. And we have to realize that that person is sinning against the Lord. Yeah. All of us in our all of us in our day, in our lifetime, are going to face issues as David had faced before. And you're going to get to a place to where nothing will relieve the pain except for just pure unadulterated worship before the Holy Ghost. <laughs> nothing can take the place of Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And when you get into that place, that secret place, See, there's a place that you can go in your spirit where you commune with the Father. Remember what Christ told us. For God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. And of course, that's part of the Scripture tonight. If we make it there. I don't know where we're going. The Holy Ghost is driving the ship. <laughs> I just got on board. I'm sailing with Him tonight. If he tells me to get out of the boat and walk on the water, well, we're going to tread on water. Glory to God. Hallelujah. How many of you have ever been so overwhelmed, and so offended, so hurt, and so disgusted or depressed or discouraged that you just thought there was just no way out? Well, all of us, all of us have gotten to that place in our life. But I've learned something when David went out when he was living among the Philistines and he went out and he was raiding some cities and he came back and he discovered that they had burnt the little place where he had erected and he and his men lived. He had uh, many children and more than one wife. And his guys came back and, and they were so angry at David because somebody had come in and burnt their little city down and took their wives and their children. And his men, his, his uh, loyal friends... They weren't just soldiers. They were loyal friends. They were willing to lay down their life for David. And they'd been fighting with him, but yet at this particular time, they spoke of stoning him. Mm. Now David could have been very fearful and he could have got on his little horse and, or he could have went in his tent and had a pity party and let him come in and kill him. Or he could have got on his little horse and he could have rode off into the sunset. And he could have said, forget this. At any given moment, fleeing from Saul, he could have said, forget this. But you see, there's no quit in God. There's no giving up in God. There's no turning back in God. Because once you've tasted of Him and you've tasted of the divine, you know that there's nothing else that's sufficient enough to satisfy every aching abyss of your soul. It says that David, hallelujah, but David strengthened himself in the Lord. <laughs> Here his guys are talking about stoning him. See, this was a low place in David's life. Now, there are many times in, in, in our lives that we reach a pinnacle, if you will, or I, I like to say we reach the, the end of the rope. And uh, the end of the rope or the end of the road, my dad used to say, the end of the road. And, and uh, you know, my dad would find these funny, funky shirts like this one I got on and... and uh, He'd give them to me and he'd say, you like it? I like that shirt. I got it for you. Did you like it? And uh, <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't tell him that. I'd just say, Dad, he saw it. Because I realized that it was a gift mm. that he was trying to give me. Because he loved me. Yeah. See? The Holy Spirit wants to give you many gifts. Yes, the Father yes. wants to bestow many gifts upon you. That's right. Hallelujah. And a lot of times we're rejecting the gifts that He's trying to give us because we're looking for a different gift. Oh, oh that's <laughs> But when the Father does something, I want you to notice something. When He gives a word or He gives a message out, I want you to notice that it's not just released unto one woman or one man upon the face of this earth. Right. But it's, it's listen, when the Holy Ghost moves, He just pours it out. There's just like, 
in my spirit I see it's like a it's like a, a map. It's like yeah. darkness, and then all of a sudden there's light from little fires, little mm-hmm. firebrands just mm-hmm. just springing up all over. That's right. Because God pours that word out and He gives it to many vessels. The vessels that are hungry, the vessels that are seeking, the vessels that are thirsty, those are the vessels that are being filled. That's what He said. If you're hungry, I'll fill you. If you're thirsty, I'll give you the drink. And those are the ones that He's given the message for this end time remnant. In these end time days that we're walking in. But you've got to be hungry for God. Hallelujah. If you're not hungry for God and God doesn't mean everything to you, Mm -hmm. chances are you're going to get that word from somebody else. But don't sit there and get mad because God gave a word to somebody else. He didn't give it to you. He was trying to give it to you, but you was too busy doing something else. Wow. Hello. Hallelujah. I know you're not a telephone. (laughs) Glory to God. Mm -hmm. Glory to God. I want you to notice that when the Holy Spirit moves, He never moves in confusion. He's not the author of confusion. I want you to notice that the Holy Ghost can frustrate and confound, if you will, the wise as He pours through the foolish things. He takes the simple things to confound the wise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We give up too much autonomy. We give up too much authority. David at any given moment could have gotten his motions and and his feelings and he could say, well, he's trying to kill me. You know, David didn't do that. I've had to leave my my kinfolk. I can't go home. You know, he he didn't do that. I don't know if you've ever been to a place where you didn't know anybody. Mm. But it's a strange feeling. I've been in some some different, different countries and and I tell you, it's, it's really a strange feeling, especially if you go into a country and they don't speak English or you don't speak their language. But you know what I've learned from the Holy Ghost? God will make a way for you to communicate. And there are certain words and there are cert- there's a certain language, a holy language, that transcends all languages. Mm-hmm. There's no language barrier when you say Jesus. There's no language barrier when you say hallelujah. (laughs) It means the same in every language. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. As God begins to give you the gifts, He gives you those gifts for others. They're not for you. (laughs) If you really desire, Paul said to desire to prophesy. But in order to prophesy, you've got to be willing to be obedient when the Holy Spirit speaks. You, you've got to be willing to do what He asks you to do. That's right. Like this morning, before 5 o'clock when He woke me up. Oh my. That's a tough one. I tell you, for five months of my life, uh, uh, I went through so much pain from this trigger nerve in my jaw. And the whole time I thought it was a tooth. And then I realized that from the accident in January, I I'd chipped two of my my crowns and uh, and it had caused a trigger nerve in my jaw and man I had so much pain I don't know if you've ever had a severe toothache but what I was dealing with was about 10 times more powerful than a toothache yeah. and all the time I thought it was good because that trigger nerve goes into the tooth nerve I thought it was my tooth have you ever been in so much pain that, that you just wanted somebody to knock you out or you just want to go to sleep well, what about if you was in so much pain that you couldn't sleep See, what Christ learned was obedience through the things which he suffered. That's good. And my thought to God this week has been, I have accepted so much goodness from my Savior. How could I not endure a small amount of pain? For I have not yet resisted, as the word says in Hebrews, under bloodshed. (laughs) <laughs> but the hour and the day of tribulation that's coming upon the earth is such as the world has never known. And God wants us to get ready. Yes. He wants you to be ready. That's right. That's right. A lot of people are looking for a fresh thing to start, a new thing to start. And a lot of people are motivated by finances. You know, it's all about the dollar, the ruble, the yen, the yuan, and I mean, you can just go on to the euro. But. But really, it's all about God. It's all about Christ. It's all about your little family. It's all about your little intimate family that's before you. God's got many precious sons and daughters that He's raising up to do exploits 
just as Peter did in Acts chapter 3. Can you turn to Acts chapter 3 real quick? Let's look at what happened there. Let's look at what happened there. This man was looking for treasures. No, this man was trying to survive. He was lame from his mama's womb. He was at... Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. What, what, what did they go up for? They went up to the temple for the hour of prayer. The what? The two minutes of prayer? <laughs> the five minutes of prayer? The ten minutes of prayer? You know, some people get to praying. I, I just lose track of time when I'm praying. I do. Mm-hmm. I lose track of time. And I'm not in any hurry. That's and right. some people just get into just, just a tizzy. They just want to get in there and get a few words said and get on out of there. But true. I'm communicating with my Heavenly Father and I'm not in a hurry. Because when I get in His presence, Lord, <laughs> Lord Jesus, Oh, when I get into His presence, I don't want to leave. Because <laughs> that's the moment that everything that's within me is communing with Him and all this earthly stuff, all of a sudden it's abated, it's eradicated, it's gone. I'm in the presence of the Holy One. Hallelujah. Yeah, that's good. So I like to just communicate. That's good, Dad. Well, it says they went up to the temple at the hour of prayer, and a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to beg, mm. to ask alms from those who entered the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms, and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. <laughs> They said, he said, don't you have anything that you can give me? Hmm. I need some money. I can't work for myself. He's begging them. He's asking for alms. He's asking for money. And I want you to notice, Peter says, look at us. So he, the man gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. He was looking for money. He was waiting with expectation. He was pregnant with expectation. He was alive with fervent hope looking for what was coming from the purses of Peter and John. You can only imagine the expectation and the hope when Peter got his attention and said, look at us. Oh my goodness. And here this man is thinking that he's going to get just a little... Um, he's going to get just a little penny. He's going to get just a little money. He's going to get just a little coin. He's going to get just a little token. But what he got was, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. <laughs> Hallelujah. Woo, glory to God. This little man, this little man thought he was going to get a coin, but what he got was a life-changing moment through the power of the Holy Ghost through God's holy servant Peter. Did you know God's called you to be His holy servant? Did you know God's called you to be a world changer, a life changer? Did you know God's called you to walk on this earth in obedience to Him and do the things that bring glory and honor to the Father? Hallelujah. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. The man could not get up on his own. Peter was so sure of the power of the anointing that was flowing through him that he reached down and pulled him up and said, Get up! (laughs) And immediately the manifestation of the power of the words of Christ spoken through Peter came to life. That's Hallelujah. Right. That's good, so he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging at the, at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Do you see that it's not just about the person that's getting healed or the person that you're touching with the power of the anointing that God's placed inside of you for you to give away to others, but look at how many others it's going to touch when you do something that brings glory and honor to God. Look at the wonder and amazement that... 
the people that don't know him yet are going to say, oh, wow. Yeah. See, when miracles take place, which is God's natural attribute, because he's a creative God, that's right. Everybody takes notice. That's really good. When the dead are raised back to life, everybody takes notice. When the lame are healed and made to walk, Everybody takes notice. When the eyes of the blind are open, the deaf ears are open. Everybody takes notice. That's right. I want you to get this in your head that God's got a message from you, through you, that He's trying to get out to others. Yes. Every single one of us has the ability to touch the lives of others. Every single one of us can touch the lives of others. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whether it's a word spoken, a kind deed done, a prayer that's prayed, yes. fasting that you have expended yourself for, laying down your life for someone. That's what prayer and fasting is all about. That's what a watchman on the wall is. That's what an intercessor is. Someone who's willing to lay down their life praying and fasting and interceding and believing for you or for another person. Hallelujah. Has God called you to do that for someone else? Don't try to build on another foundation. Mm -hmm. Don't try to start something new. Be in the vine. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Christ has grafted us into the vine. Yes. Be in the vine. Yes. Be in the vineyard. Glory to God. It's God's vineyard. Right. Hallelujah. He's mm -hmm. the husbandman. Thank you, Jesus. I had uh, a dream and it awakened me and I couldn't quite shake it. And in the dream, I was uh, driving my little car and I had uh, been up so long and I was so uh, uh, sleep deprivation had set in and I'd fallen asleep behind the wheel. When I looked up, I was going over this bankman in this deep lake. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't catch my breath and I couldn't get my window down and, and it happened so fast and I was trying to get something and find something to break the window and here I was going deeper and deeper and deeper in this water and I could feel the pressure on my head and, and I began to cry out, Oh God, make my car float. Make my car float. Take me back to the shore. Take me back to the shore. And, and as the car was pulled out of the water, I noticed there was a hearse there. And, and, uh, but it, in, in my spirit, in my mind, my car was floating and God had got me back to the bank to where I could drive the car back up on the ground. Okay, so you, so I saw two different things that were taking place in in my dream, and I know water is is uh, a sign of God's replenishing and refreshing, and also it's also a sign of cleansing. Hallelujah! And uh, and so God begins to speak to us in the in the gentlest ways, and and I asked God at four thirty this morning, I asked God for a scripture. If you will, turn over to Psalm 19, verse 5. I love that verse. Now, now I, I, was, I was amazed that God said Psalm 19, 5. Psalm 19, 5. Psalm 19, 5. Oh, I love Psalm 19. And uh, I've been reeling from this because I just this dream just happened. Yeah. I haven't been sleeping. And for God to let me sleep was just so amazing to me. And then even though I had this dream and I woke myself up holding my breath as though I was underwater in the car. And, and, uh, That's terrible. That's incredible. But I asked God what the meaning of this was. And He said, He said this to me about death. Okay? I want you to listen very carefully. He said... Death is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. See, death has no power over us. The grave has no hold on us. Death has no sting, no victory over us. This is what God said to me. He said, oh, that's just like the bridegroom coming out of his chamber. Wow, like a strong man running its race rejoicing a strong man when he goes across that finish line and he's won the race man you ever seen anybody run a little race and, and, and win it and you see the excitement and the exuberance and the, and the joy yeah in another place in the word it, it says that 
How precious in the sight of the Lord is it's the death of the saints. And as God begins to take you to a place, you know, when you commit your life to Christ, you're willing to lay down your life mm-hmm. for Christ. Right. You love not your life as to shrink from death. Right. <clears throat> Psalm 116, 15, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, we sometimes we just feel like that even though we're alive and in a crowd of people, we feel like we're all alone sometimes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We uh, were coming back, from Anna and I, yesterday from a trip to the store, and, and Anna said, Dad, did you see all them scars on that lady's arms? I said, yeah. She said, what do you think that was? And I said, well, she used to be a cutter. Mm. Now, you, can, you can see it over in, in Kings. You can see it where Elijah... Had a showdown with the prophets of Baal and how they cut themselves with stones and knives, and trying not. to get Baal to answer him, but he wouldn't answer because no. he's not God. He's yeah. dead. He was an idol. Hallelujah. God is always answering. Yeah. And friends, I don't know what you're suffering from or what you're going through unless God gives me a word of knowledge and He tells me, and then I know. But I don't care what you're going through, your valley. Is not deeper than the love of God. Hallelujah. Your trial is not over, more overpowering than the bloodshed at Calvary's cross. The power of the cross is able to deliver you from that valley, from that trial, that tribulation, Amen. from that pain. Amen. He's able to heal you, Amen. He's able to restore you. He's able to make you every whit whole. Hallelujah. Just like you read over there in Acts chapter 3. Hallelujah. He's a good God. He loves to give good gifts to His children. That's right. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more then shall the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Luke 11, 13. Hallelujah. Peter and John, they were just going to the house of prayer. They were just going where they were called to assemble to pray. This man just happened to be at the right place at the right time. No. This man had a divine appointment. There's no such thing as luck. No. There's no such thing as coincidence. There's divine appointments. Absolutely divine appointments. This man had a divine appointment. God has you in the path of many people. Mm, And they're blessed because you are the one that makes that divine appointment happen for them. That's Mm. right. That's why He's caused Christ on the inside of you to come alive. Mm. That's why He's given you such a hunger and a thirst for His Word. Mm. God is so in love with His children. Yes. <laughs> mm. Now, we're finally going to get to the Scripture of the evening over here in John chapter 4, even though we've had some quotes from it already. In John chapter 4, I have it on my iPad here if you wonder why I closed the Bible. When therefore the Lord knew, when therefore... The Lord knew. Wow. Now notice what he says here. How the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. What Christ was doing was the ministry that the Father had already ordained, if you will, through John the Baptist. Christ didn't take off in another area, in another vein. He, he took off where the Spirit was already moving. It was already flowing. Right. John was a radical man. And Christ said of John, there was not a greater man born of women than John the Baptist. Christ didn't start doing something different and new. Christ took up exactly what John was doing. Mm-hmm. And what we're expected to do is to take up what Jesus was doing. Right. Hallelujah. 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 But the Lord knew. It says, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more than the disciples than John, though Jesus Himself baptized not but His disciples, see they were making disciples, He left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And He must needs go through Samaria. Okay. Now, I want you to understand what Christ was doing was offending the religious leaders. It was offending the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Okay, King Herod was already mad too because 
they were proclaiming Christ as, as king of the Jews already. <laughs> he's the king of all kings. He's not just the king of the Jews. He's the king of the whole universe. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, what you have to understand is God, through Christ, had to get himself crucified. Mm-hmm. He had to offer himself on a cross. Wow. That's the propitiation, the ultimate sacrifice for all sin. He was redeeming us from the curse of the law. He was redeeming us from the power of death, hell, and the grave. That's right. Wow. So what Christ was doing was the will of the Father. The will of the Father was already flowing and established and set up through John the Baptist. John baptized Christ. Sadie, don't do that. Oh, don't do that. So bad for you. She's going to see my friend, Dr. Stephen Parsons. Oh. And she cracked herself. Oh. Just a little tender about that here. Yeah, very tender about that. <laughs> very. <laughs> so, Christ had to get himself crucified. And when he knew how the Pharisees had heard, see? <laughs> so he already knew that there was resentment, there was envy, and he already knew that there was an evil, wicked plot. Okay. Do you know where he was at? I'm going to show this to you because when God gives you something, it's just so amazing. <clears throat> okay. If you read all the way through this chapter, you're going to learn that Jesus was actually fasting at this time too. This wasn't when he was driven out of the wilderness for a 40-day fast, but he was actually fasting during this time too. <laughs> he must needs go through Samaria, then come he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Now there's a there's quite a testimony of of this in in the history of this if you, if you want to go get some helps and, and really study what was going on between the Jews and the Samaritans. But I want you to notice that Jesus was by himself. None of his disciples were with him. All of them had gone into the city to buy meat. Yeah. I want you to notice that this man had to have some solitude alone with God. Many of us are not willing, sometimes not willing, to give God that place of solitude. Others are not willing to give you the right to have that solitude. Mm. I'm just speaking truth. Each one of us has to have that own place where we can get along with God. That's how He develops the metal, the gold inside of us. That's how He puts Himself inside of us. Is when we get in that place of solitude with Him. Yes. When we worship Him. And right. seek Him with all of our heart. He said, seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Christ wasn't worried about the money. He wasn't worried about the food. Everybody had gone into town. And they left Him alone. He, was, he had God. That's right. He was with God. Glory to God. Yeah. Then the, <clears throat> saith the woman of Samaria unto Him, How is it that you, being a Jew... Ask us drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Mm, yeah. Told you there's some history there. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest ask him, and he would given thee, have given thee living water. Now, one of the easiest things to overlook in our lifetime is God teaches us to take in the stranger Mm -hmm. and to love them as our own. Uh, We've done that a few times around here. Uh, It hasn't always turned out favorably, but we've done that a few times. I can tell you some funny stories about it at times, but we have taken in the stranger. Hallelujah. At different times. The woman saith unto him, Sir, you ain't got nothing to draw with. Thou hast nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Mm -hmm. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Now I want you to notice that what she says about Jacob. 
she keeps making reference. This is Jacob's well. And so she keeps making reference to the integrity of a man that's been dead a long time. Yeah. I want you to notice that. What are they going to put on your epitaph? Mm. What will they say about you? Mm-hmm. Listen, you can speak a million words right and perfect. You can prophesy over a hundred thousand or a hundred million people mm-hmm. and not be remembered because of one wrong thing you say. Wow. That's not God. Wow. That is not God. See, we want to look at the dark spot on the white paper or white shirt rather than seeing all the white, we just see that one dark spot. Yeah, that's, true. that's not God. No. But whosoever drinketh of this water, he shall thirst, ne- never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. She says, I'm tired. I'm tired of toting these water pots. <laughs> Will you please give me this water so I don't never have to come back here and serve these other people and gather this water and take it back to where I'm going. See, we take so much for granted today. And we go everywhere in our house and we turn on water and we, we use running water and we just take it so for granted. They had to really go draw the water and take it back. Wow. Jesus saith to her, Go call thy husband and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast is not thy husband. Mm -hmm. In that saidest thou truly. Jesus was talking to a woman that had had five husbands, and she was with the man, but it wasn't her husband. Mm. Okay. Kind of helps you lose that judgmental attitude, doesn't it? Yeah. Kind of helps you lose that condemning spirit. Yeah. He was taking time to redeem one of his daughters. Mm. That's what he was doing. He was taking time to redeem one of his daughters. Mm. Sometimes we want to help the Holy Spirit along. We want to help the Lord along. We want to carry Him. We want to make Him do right. But they belong to Him. That's right. They're His responsibility. That's right. They're not our responsibility. Mm-hmm. They're His responsibility. Wow. The woman saith unto Him, Sir, I perceive that Thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Yeah. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Hallelujah. God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. I wanted to go over and show you where God says that His eyes roam to and fro throughout the earth to show Himself strong and mighty on behalf of those who are loyal to Him over in Chronicles 16.9. But we'll just stay right here with the text for right now. As Mark 11.11 11 would have it said that the hour is already late. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> but listen to this. Very powerful moving uh, witnessed account of what happened at the well. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah, when He comes, which is called Christ, when He's he, He's come, He'll tell us all things. Now I know there had to be, there had to be a lot of talk about Christ and what He was doing there. Mm-hmm. I mean, the news of Him spread everywhere. I mean, I mean, He touched the side of a coffin and raised somebody from the dead, and He went and raised the little girl up from the dead, and uh, to lithical me, little girl arise. Hallelujah. And uh, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Sadie. Oh. (laughs) 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 And if you go to raising people from the dead, you're going to be well known. And this lady says, well, I perceive that you're a prophet. And he goes a little deeper and he... Tells her some more, and then she says, Well, when the Savior comes, 
which is called Christ. Now, this is interesting. This is a Samaritan woman when the Savior comes. I want you to notice now. But it said the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Okay. Right. But she called Jacob her father, didn't she? Watch this. See, we're failing and we're missing tremendously when we don't take in the strangers and when we set ourselves apart from others and we get this mm-hmm. holier than thou attitude and we get this smuggish, wow. priggish spirit. Wow. See, we're we're missing we're missing some some very important wow. things. It, God's not looking for another person to win a million people or feed a two hundred million people. What He's looking mm-hmm. for is faithfulness among many. If if you'll just win one person. That one person you, that one person you you win might be the next Jim Elliot, might be the next Moses, might be the next Elijah. Glory to God. Mm-hmm. See, God's not. We're we're caught up in this thing that we want to do great things for God. Mm-hmm. Well, your great thing for God is your reasonable service, Good. which is walking in obedience to Him. Good day. And just because your bank account doesn't show that that you're as wealthy as Wall Street. That doesn't mean that God's not satisfied with you and that He's not pleased with you and that He doesn't love you. I can tell you this, the more faithful you are to God, the more His covenant blessings are going to flow. And His favor, like Teresa was talking about in a video earlier this week, His favor is going to be there. His favor is going to show up in ways that you're not even looking for. That's right. Hallelujah. We get this mentality somehow or another. We've got this mindset about this prosperity gospel, which is not the foundation that John the Baptist was building on. It wasn't the foundation that Christ was building on. But we got this prosperity mentality inside of us that says if we're not making lots of money, then we're nobody. Or if we don't have lots of money, we're nobody. But friend, I'm going to tell you something. The wealthiest people Christ called naked and poor. Mm -hmm. The poorest people which were the richest in spirit. Read it over in Revelation chapter 3. He called them rich. Yeah, that's good, Dad. See, your relationship that you're developing with your Messiah, with your Savior, yes. that's the gold standard. Yeah, that's, the gold that's, standard. The that's the wealth that Christ is trying to, to teach us all. That's good. Hallelujah. The woman saying, <laughs> saying to Him, I know when the Savior comes, the Messiah comes, she's expecting something. Wow. You can't run around saying all this negative stuff and always being a pessimistic, having a pessimistic attitude. And my daddy would have called it a, a piss poor attitude. Yeah. I'll say it. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. I mean, it's in the Bible. Piss up against the wall. So. You would have said that. But you've got to have the mind of Christ, and you've got to call those things that are not as though they already were. Yeah. Glory to God. As though they already are. You've got to be pregnant with expectation and hope. Yeah. You've got to know who you are in Christ and get your identity from Him. And that way, glory to God, when the trials and tribulations come, you're not moved. You know that no matter what the circumstances are, God's still in control. Amen. Your eternal destiny is safe with Him. That's right. Many want to trust Him with eternal salvation, but don't want to talk to Him. Until they get there, it might be a little too late to communicate then. Mm -hmm. Might be needing to communicate now. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Now, you're talking about raising the hairs on your body. Mm -hmm. Glory to God. I that speaketh unto thee am he. (laughs) (laughs) The poor lady. And of. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man asked him, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way to the city and saith unto the men, She went to the well a long time ago to draw water. She comes back and don't even have the pot. She's so beside herself because she's met the Messiah. (laughs) When you meet the Savior, what was important to you before? It fades away. It's not so important anymore. Lord, 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 help us get our focus, Lord. <laughs> Come see a man which told me all things ever that I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed to him, saying, Master, eat. See, I told you. But he said to them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. See, I told you, Jesus was fasting at this time too. He was wearied on the journey. Yeah. It's good to... God 
went to Jacob's well mm -hmm. to meet with a woman that had no hope, mm -hmm. that had given up hope, that had lost hope, that was bound. She was bound in sin. He didn't go there to judge her and condemn her. No. He went to set her free. Right. How many times have we missed Jacob's well meetings? Mm -hmm. wow. How many times have we pushed him aside and condemned him and damned him and judged mm -hmm. him and excommunicated him? Wow. Many. All of us have. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him something to eat? <laughs> Jesus said to them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye that there are four... Now I want you to notice something. Immediately Jesus tells them that he has meat to eat that they know not of. Immediately where their mind went was carnal. <laughs> okay? Now I want you to notice that. They want to know if somebody else brought him something to eat. And he's, he's telling them that his, his meat is to do the will of him that sent him and to finish his work. Say not ye that there are four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are wide already the harvest. He's there. He's there because the harvest was that lady at the well. Right. So that was his daughter. Hmm. He was redeeming her. Wow. Hallelujah. Yeah. He comes after his children. That's right. good. He's the one that creates the hunger inside of us. Yeah, that's good. He says, listen to this. He says, And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. Your actions sometimes will be the seed that you sow. Your integrity and your commitment to Christ with what you believe will be the seed that you sow because Christ is the seed. You may not reap it at that time, but somebody else will water it. Mm -hmm. God waters the seed and mm -hmm. makes it grow. And herein is that saying true once off another. I sent you to reap there on where you bestowed no labor. Other men labored and you entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all things ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them there. And he abode there two days. Wow. They were so moved by what this lady said. <clears throat> Why? Because the countenance of this lady had changed. Wow. When you meet Christ and you receive the living your waters, countenance. your countenance changes. Yes, it does. It's true. People, well. you don't have to say a word. People yeah, know. know what you stand right. for, who you believe in, and who's you, to it's whom you belong. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. It's very important that we understand that God directed me here today because mm. many of His daughters have been so tricked and trapped. I'm so sick of the lies. See, these town people came out and they believed in Christ because they asked Him to stay. And He said He stayed two more days and many more believed because of His own word and said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of Thy saying, for we have heard Him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They didn't even need her testimony anymore because they had heard the words. They had heard what she said. I am sick of the enemy trying to convince all of God's people that we need to live like hell. We need to live like the wicked. We need to live like the abominations. And telling God's messengers, the enemy's telling God's messengers, you're missing out on something if you're still chased and you haven't uh, dippled and dabbled in sex. Let me tell you something. Keep yourself chaste. Keep yourself pure for your mate. Amen. If you've missed the mark, repent. God will make you fresh and chase all over again. But listen, young people, don't think that you're missing out on something. Mm -hmm. Don't think for one minute that the lie of the enemy will bring you satisfaction. Mm -hmm. He's a liar. Right. See, what he wants to do is create a chaotic situation in your own home life, in your own marriage when God brings that right one along. If some guy tells you, young ladies, that uh, he wouldn't buy a new car unless he got to test drive it first, you just tell him that's okay. You'll just keep your car. Mm. Hallelujah. Let's be real honest. Let's be real pure. Guys, every woman is like a different spring. Why would you put that in your spirit to be tormented with it later? Girls, Every guy is a different gardener. 
and he has different tools. And he uses his tools differently. Why would you want these comparison scenarios to haunt you later on in life? I'm just candid. I'm sick of the enemy tricking God's kids, God's teenagers, yeah. and creating this forbidden fruit. God wants you to have sex after you're married. After you're married. God wants to bring that special someone into your life. And He wants to make it as best as it can be. And the marital bliss, my friend, comes when you let God make that marriage bed pure. It don't matter if you're already married and you're struggling. God's got some help for you. If you need help, contact us. Call us. Inbox us. Social media guru over there, Miss Teresa Shrepcroft, be happy to assist you. I'd be happy to assist you too. Pray, fast, counseling, whatever you need. Mm -hmm. We're here for you. Right. Don't be duped by the lies of the enemy. The first lie he said in the Garden of Eden this is that Adam and Eve would surely not die. Did anybody meet Adam and Eve today? Did anybody see them last week? Hello? The first lie, he's the father of lies. He's still doing the same thing today. It's time we wise up. Yeah. He said, be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. He said, be wise as your enemy, the devil, the roaring lion, yet be harmless as a dove. Because yeah. see, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to pull it down to strongholds. Friends, don't be discouraged and dissuaded. And believe the lie of the enemy that you've gone too far, that you've messed up again and you can't get back up. You're one prayer away from being in right standing with the Father. 1 John 1.9 Amen. Amen. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us from our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you forgive, your Father in heaven will also forgive. Be blessed until we meet again. Amen. And thank you so much to those of you joining us on the video side and those of you joining us on the radio side. Make it a great day. Join us tomorrow morning, 7.45, social media prayer time.